Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us uh, for Art History Undisciplined. Uh, I uh, think we've got a, a very exciting program ahead and uh, I will be thanking my uh, team of people who has put this together on many occasions over uh, the next day and a half. But uh, I want to start really by thanking Fern Inch who uh, has uh, transformed the kind of loose idea that, I, that we uh, came up with into um, a really uh, wonderful and rather experimental program. My name is Alex Bovey and I'm head of research here at the Courtauld and as you'll discover in a minute or two, I'm also a medievalist and am physically incapable of illustrating a talk uh, without uh, including a couple of medieval images. And so let's uh, begin with one of those. In a magnificent compilation of scholarly texts produced in Paris for the Chancellor of the University of Paris in the 1310s, the prologue of Prussian's grammar is marked by a large initial Q, and in it we see a grammar class underway. Schoolboys gathered at the feet of the master with the personification of lady grammar behind them, holding a branch labeled oratio, sentence, with branches labeled congrua, congruous sentences, which are either simplex or composita, and incongruous ones, barbaris, and the uh, uh, alternative to barbaris is in fact illegible and seems to have been erased. She is the discipline that the boys are learning, and they are, as you can see, uh, failing to learn it properly because their schoolmaster is raising what looks like a, a very um, a deliberately devised paddle in order to assault one of them. So discipline in this image em embodies both the discipline that they're learning and also the penalty for not learning it well enough. And it seems to me opposite that we might begin a conference called undisciplined with a few reflections on discipline and its meanings. In the English language, the OED gives two broad sense categories. The first is senses relating to punishment. You'll be interested to know, I think, that that's the older of the two. And uh, from the 14th century, we find it being used, borrowed from Latin, uh, to mean uh, senses relating to training, instruction, and method. A loan word, as I say, from classical Latin in uh, disciplina in Latin means principally teaching, instruction, training, branch of study, philosophical school or sect, system, practice, method. But in medieval Latin, it also comes to mean moral law, obedience to divine law, divine warning or punishment, religious doctrine, monastic rule, and also chastisement and scourging, as we can see in this wonderful historiated initial. Now, this conference is intended to eschew the punitive. I think you'll be relieved to discover. There will be no assaults uh, uh, taking place uh, in the next day and a half, um, but rather to embrace the problems and opportunities of existing within academic disciplines and also of pushing past their frontiers. There's the whole page. I can't, I can't resist the opportunity to show a miniature within the context of the page, but I will resist uh, telling you more about this wonderful book. So Lady Grammar is one of the seven liberal arts enshrined in the medieval curriculum, divided into two groups, the trivium, the arts of language, and also I've discovered on the internet the name of a heavy metal band, uh, and also the quadrivium, which are the arts of quantity. Although these disciplines were often visualized and can therefore be the subject of art historical investigation, they did not perforce include art history itself. The antiquity or modernity of art history is an open and hotly contested question. Depending on context and inclination, we can see our subject as one as ancient as Pliny or even older, or perhaps as invented by Vasari or maybe founded in the late 19th century. And in the UK, with the arrival of the exiled Warburgians and the foundation of the Courtauld Institute in the 1930s, we often trace our history in this country to that point. And indeed, as a Canadian, and I should say that probably we trace our history in Canada to that point also for so many Canadian university departments have been populated by graduates of the Courtauld, which is curiously, I think, why I find myself here at this podium today. 
So in the modern university, the trivi quadrivium and the trivium have, of course, long since given way to other configurations. Arts and sciences uh, configured as arts and humanities, uh, and uh, science and medicine often in social sciences, and they're, they're, they're after subdivided across a constellation of other uh, structures, university department structures, depending on their setting. And I don't need, you don't need me to tell you that at the Courtauld we're very unusual in not belonging to any of these particular epistemics or departmental structures, for we uh, stand in some senses alone, but in many others among uh, many, many other different types of disciplinary friends. So during a time when the preoccupation with so-called STEM subjects is driving government policy within curricula from primary to tertiary education, sometimes being in a large, even being in a large humanities department, as I was for about a decade, can feel rather fraught. And you can even feel grateful with this STEM uh, uh, buzz phrase that has been ever so dominant over the past 10 years. You can even sometimes feel grateful when someone uh, Danes to drop the A in and to talk about STEAM subjects, uh, wedging the arts between engineering and mathematics. Um, uh, but it does deserve to be there, even if it calls up a very different visual and material sensibility and set of art historical associations. So I've got a couple of slides that I'm going to share with a little bit of trepidation, and the next addition to this slide is one of them. And they come with a slight health warning in that they might cause a little bit of anxiety, and they certainly raise more questions than they address. But one of them uh, has to do with the smallness of art history in relation to other humanities subjects. And if we use the admittedly not entirely reliable uh, data provided by the Higher Education Statistics Authority, we can see that the history of art is such a small discipline um, that it actually can't really be visualized in a graph. I did try, but um, it works out to be such a small line that it's only a pixel high, um, even on this big screen. So instead, I didn't do it that way. I put it in, um, in these concentric <coughs> rings, uh, which, uh, by which I intend to uh, signal that of the 2.3 million students currently in tertiary education, about 5,600 of them are enrolled on History of Art courses right now. Um, this represents about 15% of the students in the larger classification of history. And it's also, I think, interesting to compare to other degree subjects that have art in them. So for example, if you look at fine art courses, there are something like three times the number of students uh, enrolled on fine arts courses than are uh, in the history of art. Now, is this a cause for concern. Well, it might be. We'd have to plot it on a graph, and I'd be most happy to do that with anyone who wants to later on. But I think also there may be um, some uh, optimistic readings uh, of this subject. All art history departments are right now thinking very carefully about where their students are going to be coming from in the future. In the past 18 months or so, you can hardly have opened um, uh, a newspaper with an interest in the history of art, uh, it's the important caveat, without noticing that the history of art A-level has been uh, under a very, very uh, great threat and was rescued um, by a coalition of active partners, including us at the Courtauld, but really led by the Association for Art History, which is currently working very hard to support the art history A-level and extend its provision, but also to think about the ways in which art history can be brought to the attention of students who are studying other subjects within and beyond the humanities. And I think this is a very important project that deserves our support and attention and respect. We can't just save this subject. We also have to ensure that it exists in other contexts as well. So as one of the smallest humanity subjects in, art, in, in, uh, in the country, we have to be plucky and courageous in arguing for ourselves. And we also need to recognize that we're not alone. There is, I think, perhaps a greater understanding of the value that we bring uh, across fellow humanity subjects and indeed across the wider intellectual and cultural ecosystem than we realize. For art history takes place in all kinds of places beyond the departmental structures that bears its name. As 
as we shall see over the next day uh, or so, but also, hopefully, in, I'm going to bring another manuscript in just to, just to raise the tone a little bit. Uh, this is the, the same manuscript that brought us the uh, Seven Liberal Arts a few moments ago. And in this one, we see uh, the muse of history, Cleo, uh, coming out of a vase. I wanted to name a baby Cleo, but a friend of mine said, after the Renault. And, <laughs> so anyway, I didn't get a baby called the muse of history. Uh, she's called Zoe, <laughs> which is, I think, also a very life-affirming term, I uh, think, to call a person. But anyway, there's Cleo leaping out of a vase, the muse of history. And um, I use this image to illustrate the idea that art history, in many ways, because of the digital revolution that has been going on uh, really since the early 1990s, with the mass digitization of works of art in all kinds of collections, uh, including the British libraries, anyone with an inter internet connection and a passing curiosity can find an image like this and study it. And the result of that has been really fascinating, especially given the PowerPoint revolution that has taken place since uh, the, really the early 1990s, which means that has meant that there's really very little teaching that happens in the university unillustrated. And in most humanities contexts that I know about, this has meant that art history and art works of art wind up on screens. And they've stimulated people to think about images um, in sophisticated and interesting ways and ways that have begun to underpin their research. And so we find that Clio appears by means of um, PowerPoint, the magic of PowerPoint, um, in all kinds of different classrooms. And I think this should give us a uh, cause for optimism. Art history might be marginal in some ways, but in other ways, it's gone viral. But here's my other. OK, this, this is maybe my more depressing slide, so brace yourselves. We need, I think, also to think about the financial structures, not just the teaching structures, that um, underpin and inform our subject. And as you all know, um, you probably know, at least the, the, the UK residents among you, that um, that there are seven research funding councils in this country, of which uh, the smallest is the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which gets a grant from the government of about 100 million pounds per year. And when you add up what the other six councils get, and compare it to this amount, it too is very difficult to visualize in a bar graph that can be seen even on a very large screen because the other councils added up together uh, net 2.6 billion pounds per annum. And art history, um, or rather, and the AHRC, so that's all humanities disciplines, gets um, a tiny fraction of that amount. Now, this could be cause for despair. This could be cause for art historical reflections on the David and Goliath scenario that we find ourselves in. We could feel neglected or, um, or anxious when we look at this. But we might also feel that the humanities, by and large, punch well above their weight, and that art history is, uh, I think, possibly one of the best exemplars of that phenomenon. And I think we should also consider, and this is just my you know, personal nostrum that uh, gets me up in the morning and keeps me going, even at the end of the term when there's a pile of marking to be done, that if the recipients of funding from the other six councils are charged with saving the environment, with saving lives, with, um, with preserving the economy and furthering it in some way, then what we do in the humanities is, uh, is even more profound than that. They might save lives. Our job is to give people a reason to live. And that might sound a little bit twee, but I completely 100% believe it. And uh, I think that should be something that we might celebrate uh, in the days ahead. <coughs> Our audience is potentially everyone who has visited a gallery or a museum or a ruin or a stately home. Everyone who's got a tattoo inspired by the Lindisfarne Gospels or posted a selfie uh, pretending to hold up Heitzer's uh, levitated mass at LACMA or had to scrapbook a page of their GCSE scrapbook with sources for their end of year project. 
Art is uh, about every subject in which humans have an interest, and so art history is too. And I sometimes joke that art history is a lens through which we can view all of human endeavor, but as you can probably tell from the tenor of my remarks, I'm not really joking about that. I think that it is. And that is what this conference is all about, celebrating the frontiers of art history, the places that it can be found, and its productive entanglement and collaboration with other fields of study. Now, this conference is inspired by our long-running Mellon MA program, which from 2008 uh, to 9, all the way up to 2015-16, uh, enabled Courtauld faculty to collaborate with specialists in other disciplines to offer an innovative MA that involved uh, bringing to the Courtauld a specialist in another discipline and also funding a postdoctoral researcher to support the delivery of that MA, but then also to participate in staging research events in that year. And we want to use this conference as an opportunity, first of all, to thank the people who participated in that program, the faculty who organized it, the visiting professors who came, the many uh, postdocs who had uh, their, often their first professional opportunity there, um, and also to thank uh, Marriott Westerman, uh, on, uh, who's here representing the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, who offered us the support that made that collaboration possible. The outcomes of this program uh, are um, really impressive and difficult in some ways to quantify. The dozens of participants that took place um, are now scattered all over the world. Many of them are pursuing or indeed have completed uh, research degrees. They participate in scholarly networks. Uh, uh, the thinking that was em embodied by the programs that they took uh, led to new thinking, which has sparked research projects that are some, some of them complete, some of them nearing fruition, and others very much in train. Um, so that program seeded in a very inspiring way kind of interdisciplinary opportunities that otherwise would have been difficult for us to manage in a small, single discipline institution like this one. This conference is, so in other words, partly inspired by uh, the Mellon MA and thinking about what we might do next in terms of interdisciplinary training and research. But it's also, I think, uh, embodied, embodies a new kind of thinking that we are very um, uh, energetically pursuing at the Courtauld about art history as an active, dynamic participant in the larger research and cultural ecosystem, outward looking and engaged rather than defensive. Now, we do like to look back here. We do it, uh, I think, creatively and uh, in a very committed way. One of the highlights of our program this term was uh, Professor Elizabeth Sears uh, coming to speak uh, here and at the Warburg about the entangled histories of our two institutions. So looking back at our roots is part of our radical project, um, finding out where we came from in order to plot our course in the future. But we're also very committed to looking outwards and thinking forward. And a part of that has been our, um, our, our uh, program of, of research festivals. We had our second one in April. I hope you were able to come. Um, if not, then we'll be having another one next April. But actually, you could come to the one that we're putting on uh, in uh, Belfast in October um, uh, with um, the Ulster Museum as part of our collaboration with that organization um, where we're we've lent them um, one of our, uh, our premier paintings, the Modigliani nude that you might recently have seen in the Tate show, um, and we're using that to spark a research festival in Belfast. So we're very keen to um, take our, uh, our mission, if you like, um, out, outwards and not just to stay here uh, enshrined in the wonderful Somerset House. So I want now to um, just say a few more thanks. Um, obviously, uh, very huge thanks are due now and again will be at the end to everyone involved in staging this. Um, taken together, our art history and conservation faculty add up to about a very small English department in size. There are about 32 or 33 of us, depending on how you count. Yet we put on, somehow, more than 150 research events each year, ranging from research seminars to uh, major conferences to festivals like ResFest, as well as lots of little things that are below the radar but take care and thought as well, like small research work 
workshops and so forth. And now this takes a lot of doing. Almost all the ideas are generated by our curatorial and academic colleagues, but almost all of the operational activity is conducted by the research forum team, led by the completely wonderful Fern Inch, whom you'll be meeting again later and who doesn't really like it when I do this, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, uh, and, uh, and her team, uh, Ingrid Guio, Jessica Ackerman, uh, Grace Williams, who designed our beautiful graphic for uh, this conference, uh, Edwin Kumasaru and Yost Ustra. Um, they are a joy to work with, and I'm sure you'll have fun getting to know them uh, if you don't already. So, um, I also want to thank um, Beyonce and Jay-Z, who uh, brilliantly, I just, I think, managed to keep my plan under wraps so well. Um, they finally, they dropped the album that we've been working on together. Actually, <laughs> the truth is that Beth Williamson texted me about this on Sunday, saying she couldn't write her undisciplined paper because she was so busy uh, decoding this amazing video. So, um, uh, th if we have any doubt about art history mattering, about, uh, about art history having a wide audience you need no do no more than watch Beyonce and Jay-Z's uh, video for Ape Shit which not only um, celebrates art history but I think also offers a salutary and in some places um, rather uh, stark reminder of the distance that we still have to go in our field and in our museums um, I've also they were very kind to come to the portals and pose for another shot um, so uh, um, thank you. I mean, she couldn't be here. She's very sorry, um, but uh, but uh, they um, they love this uh, painting, and uh, we refuse to sell it to them. But um, <laughs> although her her video really does explain that she could be a very um, generous benefactress, I think. So note to the development team. So they're standing in front of um, uh, our wonderful image of of Cranach, Adam and Eve, uh, with the wonderful sexy serpent a serpent whispering in in Eve's ear that she should eat the fruit, eat the fruit of knowledge. And that uh, is what I hope we'll be able to do um, today and tomorrow. In some cases, literally, because we are bringing art history and uh, gastronomical research together in uh, a luncheon that has been curated by um, Susan Babayi, term very uh, knowingly used here. Um, so we're going to do some eating and some drinking, but we're also, I think, going to take one of the forbidden apples and sink our teeth into it.